Then inside Alex Garrett Podcasting we go. Thanks for listening once again. Did you happen to hear, uh, did you happen to read A6, page A6 of the New York Times this Friday, December 21st? The headline, the UN adopts a resolution that condemns denial of the Holocaust. Finally, after seemingly being anti-Israel, the United Nations this week did put in a vote pro-Israel. And that is a big deal. The Times reports that it is a unusual, albeit symbolic, diplomatic victory for Israel at the United Nations, where the narrative is often perceived by Israelis to be biased uh, in favor of Palestinians' aspirations for their own state. Diplomats said it was the only, the second time since Israel's founding that the General Assembly has adopted an Israeli-backed resolution. The first was in 2005, establishing International Holocaust Remembrance Day. So to start out this uh, podcast, I gotta ask, is this a sign that the UN is maybe listening to Israel? One of our closest allies in the United States? Maybe so. We pray so, don't we? But here's the other thing that the New York Times reported on. This week is the 80th anniversary of the Wannsee Conference, where high-ranking Nazi leaders devised the final solution of the Jewish question in 1942. Reading this made me all pent up, all blood boiling in a way, because the place where this the, the place where this meeting took place still stands. There were wondering what to do with the building that served as an SS guest house. Some want to turn into a place and learn about the Holocaust and document the crimes of the perpetrators and officials stalled. Do you know the plan that Hitler's journey Germany came up with 80 years ago took just 90 minutes and I believe 15 people? So why it fired me up was if it can take 90 minutes to commit atrocities, to commit horrors, to commit murder mass murder like the Holocaust can we just say it can take 90 minutes and 15 people to do good if it can do, take that fast to do bad and come up with bad plans and awful things planned for a specific race a specific people then can someone be out here telling us that, hey, you could take 90 minutes and change the world for the better with just 15 people? 80 years ago at the Wan Sea Conference, in just 90 minutes, the Nazis planned up murders and, as I said, atrocities. We can do better in 90 minutes. We can work to do better in 90 minutes. We can plan a better future in 90 minutes if we just put our energy to it. If 90 minutes can create evil, then can't 90 minutes also create good? Let me say that again. If a 90-minute meeting can create evil out of it, can, can't then 90 minutes also be used to counteract that and create good, create better? Can't we butt our heads together for 90 minutes and make a fast plan for good? Or do we have not time to do that? I think we have time to do that. I really do. But on this 80th 
uh, commemoration of this meeting, which going into research, I realized that there were two uh, two endings to World War II. The, the one in which America defeated Germany and the one in which America defeated Japan. And then the following year was the commemoration of the end of World War II as well. But there were two endings that our brave men and women fought to get to and they both were winning outcomes. Which is why in that spirit I say to those that planned horror and murder in 90 minutes we will better that. We will plan good. We will plan for better. We will plan a better road for people. We can do it in 90 minutes too. We can counteract your evil get-togethers that continue to go on. Even if it's in cyber world, it still goes on. But I wanted to turn to Mr. Marty Bronstein, who... Uh, as you know, wrote the book Two Among the Righteous Few, The Courage, A Story of Courage in the Holocaust. I wanted to get Marty Bronstein on as he's had a few other versions of that book published. But found out from his wonderful wife, Leah, that Marty had passed away in July of 2020 due to cancer. So today, in the light of the 80th anniversary of that horrific meeting, find out what legacy Marty Bronstein leaves behind in the fight to bring education, to bring better to the world through his book and through his Stories and ideas on remembering the Holocaust, learning the lessons of it, and making sure it never happens again. So that today we dedicate this podcast to Mr. Marty Bronstein for all his work with students, through writing, through museum, lectures, to preserve the memories of the courageous in the Holocaust. Thank you, Marty. In the short time I got to know you, uh, you brought a light to this podcast, and we will miss you. Now, without further ado, my conversation. The last one I got to have with him on May 3rd, 2020, with Mr. Marty Bronstein. This story really feels like it hits home because a lot of people are sort of bored in the house and they're worried about sheltering in place. But let's let's turn back the clock to Jewish refugees who escaped Nazi Germany who had no choice but to shelter in place to survive. And I love your take on that perspective of the coronavirus crisis. Yeah, it makes what we're going through much easier. Yeah, so the, uh, the story related to my book, The Righteous Few, To Who Made a Difference, is the story of this Dutch Christian couple named Franz and Mien Weinacher, who during World War II, when their country, the Netherlands, was under the brutal occupation of Nazi Germany, they got involved when most did not, and in the end they saved the lives of more than two dozen Jews from certain death, which is why later on they get that heroic honor what's called Righteous Among the Nations, where the word righteous comes from in the book title. So quite remarkable. An interesting thing you picked up... Uh, one thing I was able to do, because most everything I normally do during this period got shut down, of course, in terms of speaking events and book discussions in schools, one school was able to have me do a Zoom video. They had the students read the book. They got them prepared, so as if it was normal, we just did it via Zoom. And we had some of the students wrote some things, and one of the things they wrote to why I wanted to get this in, to what you were just saying, the student said, you know, why it's tough during this coronavirus and to be sheltered in place in our homes and all that, it pales in comparison to what the Jewish refugees went through. Thank goodness 
There were people like Franz and Weinacher who helped save them. Great perspective. Well, and on the book, uh, Marty Brown, seen, since we've last talked, you've actually been picked up by a different publisher. Congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, just recently, I've been something I've been working with a long time to get a more credible publisher behind this story that's been out there. Journey with it nine years, and Square One Publishers, out of your area, they're in Long Island, said yes, uh, we'll be willing to get behind this, and they picked it up and now have republished it, slightly altered title, but still the same story, and they even gave me, I've um, got a two-for-one deal. If all goes well, at the end of this calendar year, I have another story that will be out titled Woman of Valor, and that's a true story also under this umbrella of inspirational stories of resistance and rescue during the Holocaust, and that's the story of a woman named Etta Hyatt, who's a Jewish woman who escapes into the woods in Poland and becomes part of the leadership of an all-Jewish partisan unit, and she lived to tell about it, so... It's another story like the one with the Weinachers of these very inspirational people who went against tremendous odds but stood up and made a difference. That difference, the resistance back then, uh, truly heroic. Now, I know we had last uh, spoken about your trip to New York and what that was like. Any more reaction from the fall visit to New York and actually your presentation in downtown Manhattan? Well, that New York trip I had in the fall was a terrific trip. I ended up having, I think, six different events, one inside a school and five, I think, public events. And it was all very, as I keep experiencing on this, all very well received. And I've been, you know, going like gangbusters with the book and the journey of sharing that story all the way through mid-March. Then the world stopped, you know, and went upside down. And I spent, uh, we spent a couple of months every winter in the Phoenix area. So I had a very active time in the Phoenix area. And one of my events, just if I can highlight one, is I also take this book into workplaces with a workshop titled Making a Positive Difference. And I had one with City of Goodyear, which is a suburb of Phoenix. And we had the management people all there, about 70 in the audience. And I do the storytelling with, they then draw lessons from the story to make a positive difference in their roles today. And this was an organization really working hard to build a positive culture. And boy, was that discussion rich. And they got into it, and afterwards, as they all came up to get a book, they were just thanking us for really making this uh, a joyous experience, a very inspirational story. So they were very moved by it. So it's just part of wherever I've been going. And that's just one example, and I had it in New York. The only reason this journey keeps going is people tell me you have to keep sharing this very important story. Well, you know, I just had a friend of mine a couple of days ago do an e-signing uh, of his book. Have you thought about doing any virtual signings, virtual Zoom meetings to further talk about the book? I haven't looked to do that greatly. Just did it, you know, Zoom discussions that I do instead of the live book discussion I do in a class. A couple of teachers were able to arrange it by Zoom. Most others haven't. I haven't looked to do presentations through a virtual means. It. To me, I need the live audience, so I haven't, you know, I figured we'll wait it out. The life will hopefully come back to normal when groups can gather. Certainly the events I was going to have in April, in Mar latter half of March, April, May, and into June aren't going to happen now, but hopefully we'll get them back one day. And it's okay because it's the experience of it in person. As you experienced uh, when you saw me last fall, yeah, I don't, I have not even thought... It can't be done. I mean, I heard someone tell me as an akin, and good, you know, good luck to them. Saturday Night Live people doing skits individually in their own homes with no audience in front of them. It's, I mean, I heard someone tell me as an akin, and good, you know, good luck to them. Saturday Night Live people doing skits individually in their own homes with no audience in front of them. It's, you know, and, and they all felt so strange about it. I was told I hadn't seen it, but people were telling me about it, and it's like. Yeah, I think I don't want to, I'm not looking to do that, you know, still getting the word out and talking to people just informally and getting uh, our Facebook and Instagram postings of just things, sharing things that students have said. And and so when things can pick up again, we'll go back. It's, this is so key to a live audience, unless it's again, like I did with the schools and I have maybe a book club, 
We can do virtual discussions. That works different than, a, in essence, a performance where you need a real audience. Well, I know that, Marty Brownstein, you're not going to let the coronavirus stop a nine-year journey, right? I mean, this this has hit us, but you're not going to let it stop it, stop you, right? Absolutely. You know, in essence, I had a pretty busy schedule for the spring. Summer is usually where there's a couple months where it gets quiet and then it picks up in the fall. My hope is that come fall, all the things that we were starting to plan get booked and we can go back to do more, that uh, everyone is healthy and groups can gather and we can get back doing it again because I know normalcy will come back. We need it badly, of course. People can get back to work and get back to life and the the story will be timeless. And I know from a few people who are supporting me, they, they tell me this because it relates to what you've been asking is – after this is over and people can start to return to normalcy, they're going to need something that provides them a sense of hope, a sense of inspiration. Your story will do that. It's going to be wanted more than ever. So that's my hope. So, I mean, Marty, you see people complaining about being sheltered in place and being in lockdown. Knowing what you know about the survival of the, the Jews fleeing Nazi Germany, doesn't that roll your eyes when you see people complain about today's shelter in place? <laughs> I, no, I have it. Uh, you know, it has it's rolled my eyes and all that. I mean, it's, you know, in essence, your understanding, because you know this, gives you that greater perspective. I, I understand when people are, you know, bored to, uh, obviously, what you read in the papers, a lot of people are battling anxiety through this period. You know, you're stuck at home, you can't work, you, in some cases you lost your job. And, you know, or your kids are always around, and it's just a very different existence. You know, I think it's just recognizing it for what it is. You know, while we face this health crisis, uh, we're working through it. Y you hit it. It's not like during the Holocaust when these Jews, they, staying inside was their best hope. And luckily they found people like the Weinachers who could shelter them because they wanted to go out on their own because they were feeling confined. Uh, fine, your chances of survival go way down because if you get captured, it's over. Where at least here, and my wife and I do this, you know, we go out, we go for walks. Or, you know, four, four or five times a week we're getting out to do a good walk because at least you can do those things. We can go to the grocery store to buy some things. All right, wear the mask. That ain't so bad in the greater scheme. Well, as you know, earlier this week, Mayor de Blasio broke up a hundred plus people gathering of a funeral for a rabbi in the Orthodox Jewish community. He got a lot of heat for that. But in your mind, was it infringement of religious rights on the Jewish community there? Or was he doing what needed to be done in this time of social distancing? No, I think it's not an infringement. It was the right move. New York City, I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and they were probably one of the first places to just shut down shelter in place. And that's where we have not seen the virus, you know, take off to the huge numbers. New York City is the worst spot in the country. And the fact that you have these in place, but people have these gatherings like a funeral is like, no, you got to get common sense back. And it may be a sign that the people there, this somewhat, I'll say, self-contained Orthodox Jewish community isn't necessarily too aware of the reality, even though... My understanding from what I read is they have, they're one of the highest rates of the virus hitting because they they live in such a close community. So sometimes common sense gets thrown away. Uh, so I don't think he was he was not infringing on religious freedom. He was really trying to promote health and safety. And so that's the whole key to this whole thing. And I know when I see these protests too of people open up, stop the sheltering that happen in a few different states in the country. Oh, I hadn't heard that one yet. I know there's been in other states. So maybe, you know, and I can understand the people's frustration. You know, the flip side is what these, you know, leaders are doing is they're being cautious. And the reality is, based on the numbers we're seeing, it's not like we're back to, gee, we haven't had a reported case in at least three weeks. Then, then if we're all stuck, I'd say, what are you doing? So it's it's testing people's patience, no doubt. Not easy. And Marty, I mean, it's true. We don't want to open up and then all of a sudden have to go back into lockdown. I mean, that's just another issue that's looming. Yeah, and you don't want, and that's what happened with the you know, pandemic of 1918. And I, I know we had some stories in our paper here in San Francisco where, boy, they caught it, you know, 
sheltered people in place for a month early on was very small, and so everyone, after a month, they said, okay, and then they just totally let loose, and they got hit with a whammy of many people getting ill and dying then, and so it's like, you got to learn those lessons. So when you come back, most likely, and that's what the health experts are advising, you take it in small steps. Group gatherings will probably be at the end. When you can all come back and you can go to that concert, that movie, the sporting event, you can come to one of my public storytelling presentations, but, you know, it's, it's got to give it due time. So I'm starting, at least in our area, they're doing little steps. They're, you know, construction, all levels of construction can go back to work. Just follow these, you know, health guidelines. You know, everyone has masks and keep a distance as you work, and that's doable. In time, I hope to see more of that. I think that's all going to be doable if people be patient. And so it's not like they just said, you know, lights are off and don't ever come back. No, we'll, we'll come back. Well, you just mentioned patience, and uh, I mean, patience is kind of what got the Von Ockers through, and and of course the Jewish uh, the Jewish people staying in place. That that was a lot of patience there. Oh yes, patience. You know, interesting to that point is one of the challenges that Franz and Mean Weinacher faced on occasions with a few of the Jewish refugees, you know, not surprising, they had like a couple of 19-year-old girls that they had placed, they had this rescue network, not just people in their own home, and those girls didn't want to be cooped up. That was how it felt for them, and so they ended up having to get shifted around because everywhere they went, they, it became a problem. They wanted to go out dating with the... And, and then the people who had, like, a son in the house who wanted to date the girl say, hey, we can't keep them here anymore. And so there was that impatience, not recognizing, this is what we have today as well, not recognizing the dangers that are there. Today, our life and death is not somebody coming in to kill us, but it's still this health crisis that says this virus doesn't have, doesn't discriminate. It goes after anybody and everybody if you're not careful. So stick with it. Be careful. Because in the scheme of things, the actual numbers, when you look about to the total population, it's a small percentage. But it's n enough, and the devastation that comes with it is enough to say we all have to be careful because we can't just gamble that I'll be fine and too bad for you. No, it's the patience that, that's required, unfortunately. Well, and on that front of moving around, I mean, this rescue mission that the Von Ockers did, right, it was a... It was a moving process. Like, you have Franz going everywhere in the middle of the night now, right? Uh, interstate kind of uh, travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, good qu good question. I mean, what he was doing, where they lived was in countryside in southeastern Netherlands. And where the refugees that were coming his way when this rescue operation took, took off were coming from the major cities in the west to our train ride. So he was sometimes going on the train, and then he'd kind of have to sneak them out and that not supposed to sit together on the train later when he thought the train got too risky because at the train stations too many of the gestapo around and the dutch police helping them then they even got him transported in the back of like trucks and milk trucks and so all of that is very risky let alone in their local area when you he was shifting people around or going out to su provide supplies or other support you got to do all that at night so it's, it's an amazing thing to go through that, because when you think about that, they were living, this hanging over their heads the whole time was this threat, this danger, this high risk that if they're caught, all the Jews they're helping are gone, they're gone, possibly their four little children are going to go with them, and yet Franz and Mean thrived on it. And she was key, by the way, in the whole thing. What a strong woman she was, too. Well, let's talk about that, because, I mean... How much of a backbone was she, and how crucial was her role in this whole uh, mission? Yes. Mean kept the house running. I mean, Franz was there at times, of course. But she was really, oh, and this is the 1940s. This was a strong woman, and that's not common in that time period. So she's the one often pushing Franz, and she's the one that sometimes when challenges came up, she's the one that stands up and stands firm for what's the right thing to do. And, you know, we're not going to, you know, as an example of this, they had an incident, this was kind of early on in the rescue activity where they had just started with three Jewish children, and this was, the oldest of those children was a 17-year-old girl. 
and there was who they would send out to be able to work at other people's homes under a false identity, Dutch identity, Agnes being the false name. And even some of the work she did at uh, Mean's mother's home. But then none of them knew there. But Mean had a younger brother living at home still named Bertus. And something came up with somebody, and one day they decided, we're going to have Agnes come here. We're going to give the message that she had to go back to Amsterdam to take care of her mother who got ill. And one day, Franz and Mean are going off to church, which they seldom did together, not leaving their children alone usually, but they have people in the house now. And they told Agnes to stay in here and clean up and all that. And who comes over when he normally didn't stop by? Bertus! And Mean had this sense of church there was something up. Franz, we got to leave now. So they, they leave. They don't stay to the end of Mass. They come home, and there's Bertus sitting in their living room. And he had surprised Agnes. He snuck through the window because the doors were locked. And he, he says to Agnes before they show up, I, I think you're Jewish, aren't you? And then when Franz and Mean come to the house a short time afterwards, he tells them, she's really Jewish, you know? She didn't really go back to Amsterdam. Oh, and Franz was getting nervous, like, oh, boy. And, well, Bertus, you can't say anything because, by the way, if the underground found out, they might shoot you. Mean just didn't hesitate. If you speak, I will shoot you, she said, firm and strong like that. And he was like shaking in his boots. This was one tough lady. And she gets recognition as well? Oh, absolutely. This doesn't, he doesn't, you know, in the end, when this recognition comes many years later, after her death even, of Righteous Among the Nations, when you see the plaque... It's Franz and Mean Weinacher, her full name here, Mina, on the plaque. And you can see it was them together. He could not have succeeded without her being behind him, helping keeping this going, staying strong. And to the people they were helping, they always looked selfless and fearless. So whatever was bothering them, scaring them, whatever, they kept it private between the two of them, which worked beautifully. Well, I know also that you've got quite the backbone in your household in your wife, Leah, how's she doing during this? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, my wife, Leah Bars, is part of my... I have a very meaningful personal connection to this story, as you know, when I reveal at the very end of my storytelling presentations. And, of course, we'll, we'll give your listeners kind of the spoiler alert, just to give them some context of that, and I'll talk more about my wife. But among the two dozen-plus Jews that Franz and Mean saved was a young married Jewish couple, similar in age to them, when they arrived out of Amsterdam in the fall of 43, the wife of this couple had a secret she could not keep secret any longer. She was already pregnant. You know, how do you get a baby born to a Jewish woman in Nazi-occupied Holland? Impossible, but among the many challenges and dangers and risks that Franz had been faced, this maybe was, again, the most impossible. But they took it on, and in brief, they performed a miracle. Got the baby born, and they kept her safe and together. And now, it's been a little over 13 years, I get to call her my wife, Leah Bars, and she's doing well today, making the best of this situation, too, going out for bike rides. She went out to hike to a park that she really likes that has nice hills and kind of get, gets away from things. So she stays active, and, and certainly when the journey is live, she's certainly been my number one supporter along the way. So I count my blessings. I mean, the last time we were able to go out for dinner, by the way, and it was why we were still in Phoenix our last night before they shut down a little bit after California. Uh, it was for our anniversary, so at least we got the last dinner in in good time, and then we then we drove back to the Bay Area. Well, how about this 99-year-old uh, Albert Chambers, who a British soldier that survived Nazi Germany in the in the camp, and has also survived coronavirus. I mean, folks like those, we can never not hear from right we can't hear enough stories about those kind of recoveries and the fact that they got to recover from corona as well oh yes they're treasures people like that are treasures who've lived through a piece of history and 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 gone through hard times but you know in essence i hope his family descendants they're they've gotten his oral history because these are great stories one of the places i've had a good radio interview as well in phoenix the guy's had me on two straight years because he loves the idea of stories, and he works with seniors in his business, mm -hmm. but he likes that families capture stories. So if you're quick about this guy, I hope his family has captured his story. He's got wonderful history. Talking with Marty A. Brownstein, he's the author of the new title, The Righteous View, 
to who made a difference, a new publisher as well. So, uh, Marty, of course, thanks for joining us. And during this time where we're looking for uplifting stories, yours is certainly one. Where can people find it right now to be uplifted during this time? Well, certainly they can go to, now again, the, the challenge is if you go to Amazon.com these days, they're not shipping books too much. They're so inundated. But you can certainly order through BarnesandNoble.com, Amazon.com, or go to the publisher directly, Square One with the word O-N-E, publishers.com. And you can certainly place an order. If they go to my website, that links them to Square One. And my website is www.martyabrownstein.com. And Brownstein is B-R-O-U-N-S-T-E-I-N. And certainly, this is a great time to have a good read. So I hope they do. And I, Alex, you're one of the great supporters I have on this journey, which has helped me keep this going. So thank you. So Marty, you just you mentioned the Zoom stories with the students and how important to rid whatever anti-Semitic views some might have as early as elementary school and beyond, you know, in the in the school level. How important is it that this education that you're providing gets to them to change hearts and minds uh, before too long? Oh, absolutely. It's extremely important. Well, in essence, education is what helps people overcome ignorance and prejudice. And so, when they, again, it's for me, it's always been the teacher. And I probably take this into 25 to 30 schools every year. Where in most cases, the students have read the book before I come. And I lead discussion, high educational impact. And sometimes I'll hear from students, you know, we've, I've studied some on the Holocaust. They may get some things in their history classes. And that's always about the terrible tragedy it was. But this is a very special story because here amidst the horrific tragedy is something positive. And what they really take, now again, I get the same thing when I do this with adults in the storytelling, in the workshops I do in workplaces. People are able to see the lessons of character that this story teaches. That's why I get told yours is more than just a Holocaust story. Yet I'm educating them on the Holocaust at the same time. So audiences where I just do the storytelling and just briefly touch on some history and life in the Netherlands history, and now let me tell you about Franz and Mean, they get a lot out of it. And so it's the, the value of what education does is the power of what good stories do, because they teach lessons. And that's what I'm experiencing in this journey all the time, which has been the fun, exciting part. And so I'm sure actually talking to the kids, uh, that's one way you're actually learning more about people on this journey like even the students are teaching you things that maybe you didn't um pick up on or or whatever during your nine-year journey with this with this amazing story oh absolutely okay you know i'm uh, no author goes nine years doing i know on one you know on a book and doing that i do far more than promoting a book and with it's the audiences it's the supporters like you and i've had many others i could tell stories all day about things that supporters have done and and in fact, uh, no, I think I did. You know, I got a Jefferson Award. I think I just had gotten that when I saw you in the fall. And so all of those things come from just, you know, back to my learning. I'm learning about a lot of good people along the way who just uh, understand. I, I say the character of what Franz and Mean Weinacher and others like them teach because that's the way a lot of people want to lead their lives or want their children to learn from, which is why I do these educational things as well. Of it, And it really makes a difference. And so you've definitely turned this story into an educational tool for not just kids, but adults. I mean, everybody can learn from this. Yes. You know, it's, and I'll just, if I can share a little something, too, with that. When I was in Arizona for my two-month stint, and I've, I have great reception with groups down there. I, I did a couple of courses there. They were like uh, five session, seven and a half hour courses called Heroes of the Holocaust. And I explore with the audiences. One was a, through a senior enrichment program. One was a group of educators. And what I'm doing is telling stories of this area of Holocaust education publication, least known, least recognized, resistance and rescue. And I tell about other righteous beyond my two that I represent, of course, beyond the Vinochers. Vi and I also talk about 
there were Jews who rescued Jews, and there were Jews who actually did get into resistance and fight back. And I tell the stories of a good handful of both Jews and non-Jews like this, and people just love the stories, how they're inspirational. And so that's been the neat thing of, you know, I'm a storyteller. In this area, of ho- people often don't realize, this area of Holocaust education, if you call it education, is more than just helping people never forget. It's about really apply the lessons of character. That's what makes it neat. And the stories of, I could be going all day of, I could give you you know four or five right off the top of going, here, this was an amazing person. Here was an amazing person who you know had the courage and compassion to make a difference. Talking with Marty Brownstein. Marty, in the tragedy of the Holocaust, had you yourself experienced loss of relatives or ancestors in the horror that was the Holocaust? Well, certainly, uh, my, 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 of course, my wife Leah's family, she lost over 20 relatives during the Holocaust. You know, in my family, it would be probably distant relatives because at this point, my parents grew up in Canada, and that's where they are, so they were certainly safe. My mother's father, so my grandfather, though, we had relatives in Europe, and I know in the 30s he worked hard to raise some funds, and he was able to get some of them, a good many of them, out to what was then Palestine, today Israel, before World War II started. And it was not easy to do that. So, you know, I know those kinds of things that happened, you know, at least in my family. But, uh, you know, you know, fortunate or not, you know, we, I didn't have descendants who came from Europe at that point. They came to the, 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 the major descendants, which would be on my grandparents' side, who come from Europe. You know, they came in the, to North America in the late 19th, early 20th century. So luckily they weren't there. But sure, there was probably distant relatives who do perish. At least to my grandfather, he saved some. So, thank goodness. Well, that is very interesting that your grandfather saved Jews himself. I mean, what a book that could make, right? Yes, and I wish I had more information. You know, unfortunately, he's not alive, but I remember him talking about it, and and I, it would be something to dig one day. All he, who these cousins were that he saved, I know of them, but it's too many years past. Unfortunately, some of those people for that sources are not around, and and Canada was like the United States then. Canada's government philosophy that they made policy was none is too many, which meant that they were not going to allow refugees, especially Jewish refugees, to come. The concept of refugees was not something that was cared about, understood, applied prior to World War II at all, and which, of course, causes many more to perish in the Holocaust than could have, you know, which would have been, who could have been saved had more countries like Canada, U.S., Great Britain, who could have most helped stepped up, but they didn't want. So, Marty, you mean you lived or were born in Canada, or what was your origin like? Well, I didn't. My folks did. So, But most of my relatives are Canadian. So I was, when my when I was born, I was raised in the Chicago area. My dad had come there. He had gotten his, you know, he served in World War II. He was a veteran in the Canadian Air Force. And then he got his education after the war, which is where he meets my mother, and then a job opportunity for which eventually becomes a company called Union Carbide. It doesn't exist today, but it did well. Brought him to Chicago, where we were raised, and he had a very good career there. And so, but we went to Canada all the time. I've been there so many times, and my relatives today, we, you would find mostly in Western Canada. Uh, where they came from was Saskatchewan, where the winters are long and hard. None are left there now, but most are in Alberta and British Columbia. And so it was always fun. I mean, for Americans, the reality is Canada is the easiest country in the world to travel in because it's most like the United States outside of Quebec. And so they they know more about the United States than Americans know about Canada because of, the U.S. just knows about itself in many cases. But they get American television and all that. But, you know, you're not, you don't, don't have to even drive on the different side of the road. The language is the same. The currency is similar. So it's it's a very easy country to travel and you can feel right at home. So Canada always is to me, been somewhat home. Uh, certainly, I have relatives now that have their concerns about American politics and leadership today who have told me in past, I ain't coming here until some change in your administration occurs. That's topics for other days, but I always enjoy when we, we've been able to do those visits. We were hoping to go this summer. I still have an aunt who's uh, 89, living in Vancouver. Her husband died a few years ago, my mother's brother, and she 
she's a great lady, and we wanted, we hadn't been there for two years, but right now, no travel plans for the summer until the world opens up again. We were all hoping to get to the Netherlands this summer to go back and visit the Vine Ockers, too, but right now, no such plans can be executed. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Marty, because I know that actually the Vine Ockers, one of their sons still lives in the original house, right? That is what you were telling us? Uh, one of his sons, Franz Weinacher Jr., lives in the actual house where his parents' rescue activity took place. He owns it today. It was a rental then. And he's remodeled it so it won't look the same. In the book, we have pictures of the house of the 1940s and then the house of present day. And But it's the same spot. He's there. And, you know, the other... Four siblings. There's five of them now. All live within 15, 20 miles. So we've we've been we've now I've been to the Netherlands four times. The very first time with my wife, uh, her curiosity led us to for her reconnect with the Vineockers, who she'd lost touch with, and now we're in touch with. In fact, we just recently uh, skyped Nellie, the oldest, who is the one we stay with when we go, and just to see how she's doing during this crisis and. Unfortunately, she lost her husband about a month ago, unrelated to the crisis. Oh, man. He was in his 80s and had some heart conditions and just time caught up with him. But she's doing fine, and the rest of the family's doing fine. And the other person we go visit was is the very first person who the Weinachers took into hiding and saved under her false Dutch name, Freysje de Groot. Her real name is Shula, married name Schwartz. She lives in Haifa, Israel. And we're still in touch with her, and through her daughter, we get messages, and so we we talked with uh, them a few weeks ago, and she's doing okay, just sheltering in place in her apartment in Haifa, Israel. But she had a girlfriend, back to something you mentioned earlier, who lived a block away from her named Anne Frank when she was in Amsterdam. And luckily, she met a guy named Franz Weinacher and got out of the city, because the chances of surviving in the major cities was slim. There was just too many people around. Too many of the, you know, Nazis and others' authorities, you're gonna get ratted out, and they did. The Franks did, but Shula made it to this countryside, and the whole two-year time period, she was there from the beginning, and still going strong. She soon turns 92. Well, we'll talk about Israel for a minute. You know, they're about to start an unprecedented change there, where it's gonna be the current prime minister Bibi Netanyahu, uh, who will be leading Israel. For 36 months, and then and afterward, it will be the Benny Gantz uh, team, uh, then stepping in and taking charge of Israel. What do you think about that? Oh, absolutely. We'll see how it works. They've been stalemated for almost a year, so it's they need something to at least get a government functioning that you know it's going to move forward. Whether you like Netanyahu or not, I know there's a controversial figure there. But let's hope that helps. I mean, they're obviously Israel, Holland, everywhere has been dealing with the this health crisis right now and so hopefully they all can open up soon and Shula can come outside again but we got to see her last May at this you know now we just hit May we were seeing her last year at this time in May we went for the first couple of weeks to Israel and we got to see her and hand her birthday card for her 91st birthday and now here we are a year later we just mailed the card now her 90 second coming up, but she's still going strong, thank goodness. And thank God for that, especially in the time we're in. Uh, have you tried, uh, Marty Brownstein, to broach the Palestinian community with this story, with this heroism, um, to try and build a bridge there between Israel and Palestine? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I haven't done that. I, I you know, that, that's a, that's a bigger branch or wall to climb. Can you, can you ever bring people together to help resolve differences and all that? So, um, you know, I haven't seen that yet. I haven't attempted to go into that. There, you know, the challenge right now, and, there, and I last, uh, it was a year before when I was, about a year ago at this time, I was in New York before I met you. And uh, there was a, she's a very good professor there at Manhattan College. And Manaz Afridi, who the head of the Holocaust Center with Manhattan College, who happens to be a Muslim woman, was born in Pakistan before moving to the United States. But she writes, she's writing a book, and one of the things she talks about is that in her efforts is trying to get the Muslim world to recognize the Holocaust and to get over some of the biases. You know, that's valuable work. So I think when you'd see that happen, 
you would more likely see from Palestinian communities to other Muslim communities open to the idea of wanting these kinds of stories and just seeing the human value. Today, that would probably be not quite ready to go that far. So I, you know, I, haven't, I haven't taken this story overseas. My U.S., Canada one time, and I could do more in Canada, and those are plenty right now. And they've, again, I've been fortunate they've been well-received and meet good people like you along the way. Well, for those of you just joining us the first time, you know, I have had Marty on two other times, and you can find that in a separate subsection of the podcast. But Marty, for those who haven't heard the story yet and haven't heard about you, you did leave a line of work to pursue this story, didn't you? Yeah, yes. And this is, uh, I'll say, more of a... Less of a livelihood and occupation as it is more of a, just a journey. <laughs> People have said you're an author on a journey with a mission. But when I last truly worked for a living, for 25 plus years, I ran a management consulting business, specializing in issues of leadership and organizational effectiveness, working with a variety of industries, especially managers and executives. Wrote books through that as well, a few of them through the Four Dummies series, coaching and mentoring for dummies, communicating effectively for dummies, managing teams for dummies. And that had a good run. It's helped kind of fund what I do today when I ran the business, but I wound that down a few years ago. As I then, you know, it was getting to be too much with this book. And so I figured, you know what, this is where I'm headed. This is my, who knows if you, it's not retirement, I guess, but so I, that's what I used to do. Yeah, you know, Marty, I would I would actually say this is your calling now, uh, from what I, from where I can see. People have said that, so you're you're perceptive, I guess. So as long as I can still have the energy to keep going, again, the great positive receptions I get, I even hear from audiences, this would make a great movie. We hope to move in that direction, and some one day, still hoping some things, little conversations starting to happen, but not certain yet what will come of it. But I can see, I know it would make a great movie. Because oh, that's what I used to do. Interesting enough, it's kind of taken me full circle, my wife will often say, because early in my life, my very first career is I was a teacher. I was a history teacher. And in essence, that's what I'm doing today, educating in different ways with a wide variety of audiences of various ages. But this story helps make me the messenger to help do that teaching. Well, and you do it so emphatically, Marty. You do it so emphatically. I have to believe that passion uh, was just as much there for the school teaching days as it is now. Yeah, yes. Uh, when I think back on it, you know, not that I was like that, because this story probably brings something more out of me, and, and you're doing it every day. You can only do it so much to it. But, yeah, I think, you know, people tell me you were a good teacher in those days. But I, I find that, uh, in particular, I was doing something then, because I go back a ways, so this is in the early 80s, when the idea of Holocaust being taught in the schools was pretty limited. And I made sure with my history classes, we did a whole unit on the Holocaust. Today, I would be adding a lot more because I know more about this resistance and rescue side of it. But it went over very well every time I did teach on that, and let alone anything else. But that was really, that emphasis I often got in student evaluations of the year, that was probably their most memorable unit. Thank you for teaching this. And again, back to the power of education helping people break down prejudices and stereotypes. And that's that's the reason you do these things. Mm. Amazing work. Amazing work. Uh, are your parents still alive today? Uh, unfortunately not. No, I, they've been gone for a while, but still uh, in memory. They never, I was fortunate to have very good parents. Well, and I have to, I have to believe, Marty, that you have, that they're looking down on you in spirit, guiding you through this as well. Yeah, I, yes, I would think if they were around, they would appreciate this. My mother in particular, who was quite a lady. And in the future, we'll come back on another podcast down the road. When Woman of Valor comes out, we'll spend time exploring that story more because that was a, an amazing woman that this story is about. That I was fortunate to have her family members support me in putting that book together. Well, tell us about that really quickly. What are their plans with that post-COVID-19? If all goes well, because now the big if is because of the virus, who knows? The intent was that it would come out towards the end of 2020 here. So in essence, it's hitting the market very well by the start of 2021. Whether that holds true or not, I don't know, because things are kind of up in the air. But 
you know, the, the deal is signed, the publishers begun work on the, you know, their side of it, the editing and producing it. So it will come out. It's just right now, things have just created such an uncertainty of that. But that's the intent. Well, Marty, thank you so much for coming on today and really spending this time with us. Keep telling the story. It's inspiring people everywhere, not only just in New York City, the, the crossroads of the world, but everywhere. And I'm, I'm very happy we get to have these conversations. And, and thanks for sharing your story uh, each and every time on here and elsewhere.